Are you ready? Huh? Ready to get started? Alright. Well, let's do it. How about that? So I've got a little project here that I want to share with you that I have been wanting to do before I even started fixing my shop that was broken down. This has been on the list that long. So let me share it with you. Now what I want to do is I want to be able to hold this 100 millimeter, almost four inch independent jaw, four jaw chuck. I want to be able to slide this in to a inch and a sixteenths 5C collet. Why? Because I've got a lot of fixtures that take 5C collets. And one of those, and the major reason that I want to do this is because my powered workhead that I use on my cutter grinder and my surface grinder, it takes 5C collets. I'll be able to put this in there. I'll be able to hold odd shaped items. I'll be able to offset grind several different you know, there's a lot of reasons why four jaw chuck that'll go in a 5C for me would be handy. So let me give you a quick example, right? One of many uh, that you could make with this fixture. And uh, I'll show you the parts, give you the breakdown, and we'll get started cutting some material. All right, so here's an example of something that could be done, one of many things that could be done. If I can power this in my rotary workhead that I use on both my surface grinder and my cutter grinder, and that is offset grinds. You can see that neck of this small carbide boring bar, how that is offset. It's eccentric, right? One of many things that can be done. Now you can't do that in a standard 5C collet. Right? Can't do it in a scroll three jaw. Right? You can do it in a soft machinable collet. Right? Machine your offset into that, but that's pretty specific. And right, unless you want to machine this to every diameter or buy one and machine it to every diameter, and then you're stuck with round items only, right? Which I want versatility over something that specific, right? So that's why I'm making this little fixture. Now, let me show you the material that we're going to use. Not ideal, I didn't say it was, it's not, but it's what I got, right? Piece D2 plate, 5 8 thick, Blanchard ground. It's that or mild steel, cheese grade. So we chose this. Let me show you. We'll lay it out, right? We'll go to the saw, and then we'll go to the other machines that we need to make this a reality. So all I want is a square chunk off of this. So we'll go over the saw, and we will cut that off. So I'm over here at the big saw, the do all, and I'm going to use the hydraulic feed on this. Now this is a carbon steel blade, so I'm going to run the blade slow. I'm going to run relatively high feed pressure with this hydraulic table, and I'm going to run coolant to try to make this thing survive. So I'm just squaring the work up with the table so we get a decent cut. All right. Clamp this thing down and hope for the best. I want to burn up this blade. Maybe speed it up just a little bit. What I want to do is not generate a bunch of heat. You know, just put some pressure on those teeth and keep them cutting. So it's doing really good. Just running the blade slow, keeping it cool. Keeping it cutting. You know, just don't want that blade to rub and work hard on anything. There we go. Did it. So I'm going to pull off this big three jaw 
and I'm going to load up my, I think it's a 8 inch, oh sorry, Cora, I stepped on your paw. I'm going to load up this uh, South Bend four jaw here, and we're going to use it. So I've got a little bit ahead of myself here. Um, I don't know that these two surfaces are parallel. It is a Blanchard ground plate. You can see there's no mill scale on this and there's no mill scale on the other side. This was ground before it was shipped out as, as stock. Uh, but I'm not sure that it is parallel. I want it to be. So what I'm gonna do is run a file around these edges, knock it off, set this on, clean it up, set it on the surface plate and check it super quick. If it is parallel, I'm just going to plop it right back in here and, uh, you know, there we go. If it's not, I'm going to throw it on my surface grinder real quick and just dust it off, right? That way I've got two parallel sides here and I know I'm starting with a nice, uh, you know, starting with a good platform. So I'm glad I stopped and checked this. Look, you know, it's dished. Not bad, about a thou and a half, right? So I'm going to put this face the concaved face down on the mag chuck, lock it down, and then dust it, flip it, and dust it. You know, I'm glad I checked it. It's not really bad. It probably wouldn't make much difference, but I'd rather it be flatter than that. So that's about as good as it's going to be. A couple tenths, right? Good enough. Feels good, don't it, girl? So now that I've got this plate uh, pilot drilled, we're going to drill it to almost tap drill size. 15 16 is what we should be drilling our hole to. We're going to undersize drill and then bore to our final 15 16 uh, hole diameter. Because for one, I don't have a 15 16 drill bit. And for two, it'll be just a little straighter if it's bored, most likely. So this is 123 RPM. 
right? If you're new into machining, you want to go pretty slow with the larger drills. You know, they just last so much longer. You kind of take it easy on them. Actually, this D2 steel is cutting very nice. So this little boring bar is from Steve Barton over at Solid Rock Machine Shop. He's got a YouTube channel. A very nice little bar. So I've got my hole cleaned up here. I'm just going to get get a measurement here, zero my dowels, work my way out to 15 sixteenths, right? And then we'll get set up with a threading bar, a little carbide threading bar. That's what I plan to use. And we'll uh, you know, get started uh, putting some threads in this plate. should be it. 9.37.5, that is 5 sixteenths. So let's see what we are. Hmm. 9.37. I'll take that. Good finish as well. Really nice finish. So here's something that I've done quite a bit of, and this is a this old half inch carbide end mill, really good quality carbide. And you know, it was all chipped up. It was beyond the point of resharpening, but it still was a good solid blank to turn into a different tool. So I turned it into a 60 degree threading tool. You can still see some of the remnants of the bottom of the four flutes from the cutting edges, right? This one's concentric ground. You can see the, the shank here, central shank, or it's centralized in the body, right? Could have offset ground that, had a little more cutting edge out here. Right, give me a little more to work with and still keep a good neck diameter for the rigidity if I could have offset ground that, which I didn't, but you get the idea. Still a nice little tool. Right, I use it quite often and I've got quite a few of them. It's a little fishtail gauge here. This old craftsman fish tail gauge. You can use it off the back. The two, two little fins there is what I like to call it. And we can come in with our cutting tool and make sure that we are lined up properly with the bore. We know this, this face is parallel to this hole. So we can come in, bring our tool, make sure it seats properly in the little grooves here. Then we know that our tool is lined up properly with the work. Oh, that looks pretty good to me, right? We're seated all the way around on our little 60 degree groove there. Tool nests nicely inside there. Right, so we need to be in 14. 14, travel down, and that is telling me that we need to be in selector number two over here. So what this does is for every 14 revolutions of the spindle or the chuck, the carriage driven by the lead screw will move one inch, right? So 14 threads per inch. So on my lathe, I keep a neodymium magnet and all of my relevant uh, Allen wrenches for my insert, changing inserts, all right, my fishtail gauge, just clip it right to that. And, you know, my, my uh, scale, I've got a magnet over here for it.
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in, I'm going to touch off just to see the, the die scratched off inside there. I'm going to zero that on my dial. I'm going to back out, set a light depth to cut, a couple thou, a few thou, whatever, come through, do a scratch pass, check that thread pitch with my thread pitch gauge, if everything's correct, you know, set the depth of cut, you know, back and forth, rinse, repeat, make several passes to it, we get our, our thread depth that we're looking for. There's zero. Dial in a few thou. We will come back through. We will engage our lead screw. Disengage. We'll back out of the cut. Then I'm going to reverse my lead screw and just back out so I don't have to continuously you know, chase my thread dial here. This lathe, you know, allows me to reverse the lead screw, which is nice. For short threads like this, it's super handy. So there's our 14 TPI thread pitch gauge. Now I'm just gonna come in, check my scratch pass here. Make sure that it's correct. And it is. Right, and proceed cutting the thread. Alright, so I got the thread basically 90% of the way done. I'm gonna start this tap in here. Alright, check it. Looks looks good to me. I am gonna finish this out with the tap just because, right, I'll get a perfectly formed thread this way. Also, uh, you know it's not gonna it's not gonna make a, any difference. We're gonna use this face as a shoulder. When our shaft threads in this, it'll have a shoulder on it that's concentric with the thread, or that's 90 degrees to the threads, and it'll butt up against this. It'll hold everything nice and straight once it's tight, right? I'll also have to take this to the saw after I mark off the diameter that I want on this. We'll cut off the excess chunks. We'll make our shaft. We'll thread it into this. We'll flip it in the lathe and then turn this to the diameter that we want. That's kind of the thought. Old end mill with the uh, 60 degree points turned on it. This is going to go in the chuck, right? And then the chuck's going to be extended to the center and the back. That'll support it. Just turn this with a wrench, right? Finish out my thread. That's the idea. All right, so I'm back over here at the big do-all saw, and um, the reason I'm over here is just because this is one of the quickest ways to delete these corners. Once I turn the central shaft that goes in this, I could spin those off in the lathe, but you're talking a lot of interrupted cut for a long time. This saw will make a lot shorter work of these corners than I could do on the lathe. So that's the plan, is to delete these edges.
So now that we got our backing plate pretty much roughed out, right? We've got a good start to this. Now it's time to go to the lathe for the shafting part of this. We'll turn this, you know, probably a four inch or five inch section down to inch and a sixteenth. So that's the call that this is all gonna go in. We will thread a short section to match this, so inch 14, right? We'll screw this together, hold this in the three jaw, turn our OD of our uh, backing plate down to 100 mil, size of the body of the chuck. Then we'll go over to the milling machine is the plan. We'll hold this in our rotary table. We'll put in our four hole pattern, right? We've still got to put in our ledge as well, a register. Not that we really need a register for this, but you get the idea. We, we may do that because we can. So let's go back over to the lathe and get the shafting part of this little uh, fixture done. So back in the lathe, I said an inch and a sixteenth over there. I meant our OD, this shaft, major OD, is going to be an inch and an eighth. Then we'll turn uh, down to an inch, small section, the length of the thread that we need, and then thread it, right? Does that make sense? Easy to get confused. down just a little bit. So I've got ahead of myself, I've already made a mistake here. Now my original intentions was to leave a bigger shoulder here for this plate to screw up to and register, right? Now, because I turned this all down, uh, I'm not gonna have a much of a shoulder here for this plate to register against. Um, I was gonna, it's not a lot of material here, but you know, it plus what I need to turn off for the major OD of my thread would have left me, I was hoping enough shoulder to give me a good register, keep this plate running true, but you know, I didn't. So I'm just going to continue on with this, see if it works out. If it does, fine. If it doesn't, I can remake this piece. But you get the idea. I should have left the extra material out here for a little shoulder at the end of my thread. But whatever. I need to turn this down now to, uh, to an inch, right? Major OD of the thread that's going to be here. So now that I got the end section turned down to the major OD of the, the thread that I'm going to be cutting on it, I got a little tool in the holder here that's doing two things. I'm creating a shoulder, a shoulder that's 90 degrees to the shaft that when I screw that plate on up tight next to the shoulder, you know, it'll register and hopefully keep that plate to you know, 90 degrees to the shaft. I'm also creating a thread relief here, running a little fast as well, so I had to slow the lathe down, getting a little chatter. Uh, this a lot of stick out non-supported end so double duty we're creating a shoulder at the same time that we're creating a thread relief that will be about ten thousandths deeper than the minor diameter of the thread that gives us a place where we can stop our thread so there you go that's what we're doing here
Test fit. Should be really close. Now we're there. That's it. Yep, that's good. That's what we want. Excellent. Right up to the shoulder. I'll just buzz that off, a little extra there. I think that'll work. All right. There we go. I'm gonna go over the saw and buzz that off there. Check that out, I made it. Yeah. So I'm not super worried about this thing running absolutely perfect. Right? It's powering a, a cheap forge off. Plus, I, once I get this done, you know, I can put this in my powered work head and run my grinding wheel across this, and I can get it to run really about as good as my machine will run. So I'm not too awful worried about it at this stage. What I'm going to do is, I mean, it should be good, right? I'm not saying it's not good. It's just, right, it's not the end of the world if it's a thou or two off so I'm just going to clean this up really good and then uh, put some never come off juice on it and uh, then we'll go back over the lathe we'll turn this uh, down to uh, a little over 100 mil and then we'll go over to the mill put our bolt hole pattern in it right So brazed on carbide is what I'm going to use for this interrupted cut in this D2. This is some of the tooling that I cleaned up on the shaper and on the milling machine. Had to reduce the height of these uh, tool bits because I couldn't get on center with these holders, right, with them being up so tall. So I had to take some material off the bottoms of these to get them to work. Brazed on carbide for this kind of stuff, you know, really nice.
So although I don't use Braised On Carbide a whole lot, I like to keep a few good pieces of it around simply because it's great in my opinion for interrupted cut and abrasive materials. Because the carbide is right, you get the benefits of carbide and the rigidity of one solid tool, seeing as it's welded on. You know, and I know a lot of guys who use it exclusively on their lathes because they don't want to grind their own high speed steel tool bits. And then I know guys that don't have any of it and they rely solely on insert tooling with individual replaceable inserts. And although those are awesome, if I had to choose, and I did here, uh, whether to use uh, just an insert tooling, uh, you know, on this interrupted cut or a brazed on piece, obviously I chose the, the brazed on carbide simply because it offers the benefits of carbide and the rigidity of a solid tool. So now it's time to put our features in this. We need four bolt holes on whatever spacing this is or whatever circle. So we need to figure that out. So let's, I don't have the paperwork on this, so I'll just figure it out super quick here. We will zero on the diameter of one of these bolts. So zero. Then we will span across two. 3.2 or 3.3. Yeah, 3.304, let's say. 3.304 inches or, three metric guys, 83.93, 83.93 mil. So that's our bolt circle with a division of four. So let's go over to the mill. This is going to take a minute to get set up on, on it and uh, see if we can't, you know, make that happen on this.
So I've got my coaxial indicator in the spindle of the mill here, and all this does is tell me how far off center I have to know where this rotary table is uh, in relation to the spindle on this machine in order to get the proper offset from center that I need to get my bolt hole pattern in this flange. So this indicator you know, is registering off of an end mill shank that I've got held in the chuck of the rotary table here, and as I spin, the, uh, the spindle here, it gives me a reading on my uh, coaxial indicator that tells me how far off in X and Y I am. So, showing that I'm too far this way. So just go a little bit. It's pretty close. Low. Still too far off. Let me bring you in a little closer. So it's just got that little arm. It's just registering off the diameter of that pin there. So let's go in a little. I'm taking the table this way. Just a little. Just a little more. Okay, went too far. About a thou. We are very, very close. That as good as it's probably going to get. there. I'll take that. So after a very long and vicious debate with the rest of the machinists in this shop, I have decided, ex I made the executive decision that I'm not going to put a register on the front of this to lock into the step, right, whatever, it's a register on the back of this chuck. I'm not going to put that in there. For one, this is going to live on a grinder. It, you know, it doesn't really need need to register there. That uh, that would just assure that whatever inaccuracies I have in that register stays in the body of the chuck. If I oversize my bolt holes just slightly, right, because it's going to be super close. If I oversize the bolt holes that I drill in that, I can tweak, loosen this up, you know, tap it around, tweak it, make it make the body run true. Not that it necessarily matters because it's four jaw, but you get the idea, right? I'd rather have no ledge for this application than to be locked in to that position. Does that make sense? I think so. Right? So there we go. Let's put our bolt hole pattern in this thing and, uh, you know, be done. One point six five three is our offset. So because this is just a simple four hole division, I'm not going to go through the trouble of setting up indexing plates. It's just not necessary, right? Now, this rotor table and almost everyone I've ever seen have 
divisions around the uh, you know, around the perimeter of the table here and all I'm doing is setting that on zero zero in my hand wheel here starting off at zero so zero 90 uh, 180 270 right done right four holes and you can get well within the needed accuracy for a bolt hole pattern just by simply doing it by hand. In fact, it can be every bit as accurate, or more. So I'm out of Z clearance, so I've got a stubby, this is a left-handed drill, a little stubby uh, made by, uh, really, I use this primarily for uh, broken bolt removal, but I don't have a stubby standard, you know, right-handed helix drill. This is from Drill Hog, it's a really good quality drill, really like their drills. So I'm going to slow that down just a little bit. I'd rather run a drill too slow than one too fast. So it's time to counterbore the back end of this plate. Now what I'm trying to do is make the hole a little bit bigger, just partially through this plate so the bolt head sits down in the material instead of, you know, just button up against the back there. That's the idea. So we've got our counterbore in there, right? It's piloted, so it's a really nice adjustable pilot set counterbore. So I'm just going to bring this down, right, touch it to the plate. I've got the thickness of the bolt head that I need to counterbore down. So what I've done is I've taken my quick stop here, right? Touch the bottom of the bolt head to the stop well, that's hooked to the quill. Come in and set that. So I know that this first hole, right? It's just a test hole, really, is going to be at least the distance, the the depth of the thickness of this bolt head. Right, if I'm happy with it after the first one, boom, 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 right, we do the rest, and then we're done. All right, super slow on the counterbore.
That's it on the first one. I'll just do a quick test fit. If I'm happy, we'll do the rest. On the cutter grinder and the powered work head. Boom. Let me show you something else I can use this on. I need this collet. All right, so I'm kind of stating the obvious here, but anything that accepts 5C, I can now, right, use this four jaw chuck in. Uh, USA horizontal and vertical indexer. Nice, very nice. There you go, I like that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, children of all ages, I guess that's it this week. A little longer video than what I normally do, but I think it was worth it to finish this off in one go. Simple item, but man, that adds a lot of versatility to the shop. And there's been a lot of times where I wanted to offset grind, but I just, you know, didn't want to have to cut a custom collet to do a one-time deal. This allows me to, you know, hold anything and offset, right? Odd-shaped items, um, and it will go in any of my 5C uh, collets, right? So any of my 5C collet fixtures, that is. I could also go as far as to re-drill the back of this to the same three-hole pattern that this self-centering three jaw chuck has and then I can use that in the powered work head. So, you know, this adds a lot of possibilities that it didn't have before. So I'm glad that it's done. So that's it, I guess. Uh, thanks to my viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out whatsoever. It is much appreciated, especially this time of year. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, right? <laughs>